Hey guys, it's Marshall and Dr. Farwell here with PhysioU and today for the Mentory Minute we're going to talk about HIPOA. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is the diagnostic criteria. In the 2017 new guidelines that the APTA put out, they changed some of the numbers from what we were used to. Some things stayed the same, such as age over 50, uh, pain in the anterior or lateral, so kind of giving you that C sign, any weight bearing activities, and then stiffness lasting less than an hour in the morning. Some of the things that are different is in the objective when you're looking at range of motion. It's now saying that hip internal rotation less than 24 degrees or a different side to side of less than 15 degrees, as well as flexion, a difference of less than 15 degrees side to side um, helps with that diagnostic of hip osteoarthritis. When we talk about our objective assessment, we want to make sure we include some type of functional assessments. It's always good to use one that have norms. Um, so we can kind of compare them to what is uh, other people with HIPOA as well as to let them know if they're changing along the way. So two of the ones that the guidelines are implementing are sit to stand, so arms across your chest, 30 seconds, all right, and go, and as many times as you can, up and down in 30 seconds with the mean of about 12, like 12. and then when you recheck it later on, uh, minimal detectable change has got to be about 3. The second one, you can go ahead and take a, take a rest there. The second test that they use is the step test. So place your symptomatic leg on the step, right, and you're going to step up and step down for a total of 15 seconds. Right? Go up and back down as quick as you can, safe as you can, right? looking for an average of about 14. And again, the minimal detectable change is three. So when you recheck it later to see if it's changed, you're looking for three more. You can go ahead and stop there. When we talk about interventions for hip OA, there's a lot of research that compared manual therapy to Therex, Therex and education to just Therex alone, manual therapy and education to manual therapy alone, and really a lot of them came out with it's a collaborative approach. The best articles, the best outcomes were a combination of manual therapy, Therex, and patient education. So uh, for today, we'll show you a couple of manual therapy techniques to improve hip mobility. So the first one, the MWM, okay, you want to place a towel or a couple towels kind of just give the, uh, some support against the belt when it's pushing here. Otherwise, you won't be able to get as much of a lateral glide. Okay. Put my Mo belt on. Have the patient kind of help you get as close as they can to their hip joint. And then you're gonna kind of place the belt around your buttocks. All right. One hand stabilizes the patient's pelvis. The other hand is supporting the femur. Right. You're gonna add a lateral glide, hold that, and then move into flexion. Ideally, it shouldn't be painful, or it should be as minimal pain, minimally as painful as possible. Add the glide, flex the hip, bring it back down, you can let the glide off. Right? If you don't notice a change in range or a change in pain, you can always change your angle a bit. Right? So maybe lateral with inferior. Right? And you should perform multiple times in the flexion, as well as into interrotation. So for here, add the glide, right? internally rotate his hip, come out, let it go. Okay. As you progress to more range, you can start to couple the motions a little bit to where I add my glide, go into flexion with some internal rotation, and come back out. Okay. Nice thing is in that 2016 study, it showed within one session a 12 degree increase in flexion and a four degree increase in internal rotation. Another great technique to improve hip mobility is a thrust technique, so longitudinal distraction. So take the hip, flex it to 30 degrees, externally rotate it, Right. Make sure you kind of grab above the malleoli so you're not just distracting the tail cruel joint. Right. Kind of sit back, lean back in there, right. and then give it a thrust. You can repeat that multiple times as long as the patient can handle it. Um, another great technique to improve flexion would kind of be this posterior glide where you cross the leg over to the table. And you can either do it from the same side and have to get your body over because you're going down towards the femur. And I like this one because I can stabilize the pelvis a little bit better here. Lean in, then add a posterior glide using my body weight. Okay. Another way that it's taught is coming from the opposite side. Again, using your chest on his knee and giving a posterior glide. Okay. The patient should feel this in the posterior part of the hip if you're doing it correctly. So when we send patients home, we want them to work on their range of motion as well. Right, and so if we know that MWM, that lateral distraction was helpful, we can have them set it up at home as well. So the patient will kind of do a single knee to chest, but we'll have them place a belt or a sheet, something that doesn't stretch into the lateral direction, and then they just hook it 
to a table leg, a chair leg if they're on the floor, a bed post if they're in their bed, and they get that lateral distraction, and they just pull the hip up and then let it go. All right, flex it up, use their hands, overpress, let it go. All right, they can do it a bunch of times this way. Another great option is in quadruped as well. So go ahead and flip onto your hands and knees there. And as they rock backwards, right, they're rocking into hip flexion. And back up. But now we can add this lateral, this lateral glide. So again, they would hook it to some type of furniture here. Right, get up as close as we can to the hip joint, and then rock backwards. Perfect. And then rock back, all right. Trying to make sure that they keep their back as neutral as possible so it comes from that hip joint. And relax there. All right, last thing I want to talk about is a new change to the guidelines as well, which was about uh, weight management. A, there was a nice study that came out that looked at losing, losing body fat percentage and BMI. So a loss of 5% BMI or, and 3.5% of body fat correlated to a 17% improvement in Womack and a 25% reduction in uh, hip pain. So, uh, so we can educate our patients about just overall being active, but also maybe choosing wiser decisions when it comes to nutrition and eating to help manage these hip symptoms. Thanks for joining guys and hope, hope to see you next time. Take care.